For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 is a tremendous statement from our all-loving God. It beautifully encapsulates the theme of the entire Bible. God loved humanity, His willfully wayward offspring, so much that He gave the greatest gift He could possibly give, and the only gift that has the power to save man from sin, the perfect sacrifice, the Son of God, and anyone who believes in Him will be saved from punishment and receive everlasting life. Several years ago, I asked a gentleman if he would be interested in a personal Bible study. He responded to my question by asserting that he knew John 3.16 very well and that John 3.16 was all the Bible he needed. Enough said. Case closed. No more Bible to hear or heed. I love John 3.16. It's my favorite verse in the Bible. But it's not the only verse. If John 3.16 were enough, why did Jesus teach so much more? Why did John write so much more? And if the Holy Spirit was content with man only knowing John 3.16, why did He inspire men to pen thousands of other eternally beneficial statements? Both logic and the Bible demand more than a John 3.16 only kind of faith. Many make the assumption that God always means what they think He means rather than what He said and explained He meant. In particular, it seems many people consider the belief of John 3.16 that saves man from his sins is a mere acceptance of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and my personal Savior. They seem convinced that since they acknowledge Jesus, then they will receive eternal life at the end of time. Yet without more information than is provided in this one sentence, and especially without context, a person simply cannot know for sure. The best place to begin to ensure that we have a more thorough and proper understanding of John 3.16 is John chapter 3. The 36 verses in this chapter can be read in about three minutes, and yet the deep, life-changing, soul-stirring truths found therein can be meditated upon for a lifetime. In the immediate previous statement to John 3.16, Jesus referred back to a moment in Israelite history in Numbers 21 when God punished the ungrateful, complaining Israelites with venomous snakes. After many died from being bitten by the serpents, the people of Israel confessed their sins and asked Moses to pray to God and intercede on their behalf. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Jesus compared Moses lifting up the bronze serpent in Numbers 21 with the Son of Man being lifted up, adding that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Carefully consider that the afflicted Israelites in Numbers 21 could learn of the critically important, life-saving truth of the bronze serpent and yet still not be healed. They could even believe in the sense of mentally assenting to the truth that if they looked upon the bronze serpent, they could be healed and yet still not be healed. Unless they believed in a deeper sense and actually left the comfort of their tent, walked or were carried through at least a portion of the vast camp which was comprised of hundreds of thousands of Israelites, opened their eyes and looked in the direction of and literally upon the bronze serpent, they would not be healed by the great healer of their deadly physical condition. Likewise, Anyone who is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins and who is without Christ must look upon the Son of Man and believe in Him. This belief is no more a mere mental acknowledgement of Jesus being the only answer to the sin problem than it was for the Israelites to merely acknowledge that the bronze serpent was the answer to the deadly physical disorder. God is the healer. But He only heals those who faithfully follow His approved prescription. Interestingly, in this same conversation with Nicodemus, only ten brief verses earlier in John 3 verse 5, Jesus stated, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
Notice that Jesus required something of those who desire entrance into the soul-saving spiritual kingdom of God. They had to be born again of water and the Spirit. Jesus doesn't say that one merely mentally believes an important truth for entrance into God's kingdom. He certainly doesn't say to repeat the sinner's prayer for entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus stresses a serious requirement. Unless one follows his directions, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what does it mean to be born of water and the Spirit? Perhaps the better question is, did God give us any indicators in Scripture, including here in John 3, to further explain Jesus' instructions to Nicodemus? Could it be that the inspired Apostle John was referring to water baptism? He previously noted three times in his gospel account that John the baptizer immersed sinners in water as he preached about the coming kingdom. The apostle John highlighted the fact that after Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went to Judea and baptized. John then immediately referenced John the baptizer again, this time noting that he was baptizing in Inon near Salem because there was much water there. Finally, John the Apostle remarked at the very beginning of the next chapter that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. Given the fact that so many Jews in Jerusalem and in all the land of Judea were being baptized by John the baptizer as well as Jesus' disciples, and considering the Apostle John's frequent mention of immersion in water, not to mention the dozens of times that water baptism is mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament, it makes perfect sense that Jesus was referring to water baptism in John 3, 5. What other action in the New Testament involving water is associated with entering the kingdom of God? Paul indicated that Christians have been sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water by the word. He also taught that by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Peter noted that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God. James wrote that God begat or brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. And, of course, Jesus said we must be born of water and the Spirit. It is biblically consistent to conclude that the Holy Spirit's divine seed, His Word, the Gospel, is planted into our minds and works powerfully in our hearts to produce a life-changing understanding of Christ which leads to immersion in water in order to enter God's kingdom. Still, even if a person concludes that he simply doesn't understand Jesus' statement to Nicodemus, he surely must admit that Jesus' instructions in John 3, 5 do not harmonize well with the shallow, mere, acknowledgement-like view of belief in John 3, 16. In the final verse of John chapter 3, John makes a very revealing contrast that helps to further clarify the saving faith of John 3, 16. Unfortunately, the specific contrast is unclear in some versions. For example, the New King James Version reads, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The KJV likewise contrasts believing with not believing. However, the underlying Greek terms are actually different. John did not contrast believing and not believing. He contrasted two different Greek words, pestuo, to believe, and apatheo, to not obey. As seen in most versions, John contrasted one who believes in Jesus with the person who does not obey him. Thus, to really believe in Jesus is to fully submit to him, to obey him. As J.H. Thayer noted in his Greek lexicon, when the verb pestuo, to believe, is used, especially of the faith by which a man embraces Jesus, it means a conviction full of joyful trust that Jesus is the Messiah, the divinely appointed author of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, conjoined with obedience to Christ. The Apostle Peter similarly contrasted the believing with the disobedient in 1 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8, saying, This precious value, then, is for you who believe, 
But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were appointed. The Hebrews writer also used these terms, or derivatives thereof, in Hebrews chapter 3 in an enlightening manner when explaining that the Israelites were not allowed into the promised land because they did not obey. Yet the next verse states, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And then six verses later in Hebrews 4, 6, the writer declared that they did not enter because of disobedience. When the Bible is allowed to explain itself, both in John 3 and elsewhere, we learn that a real, trusting, saving faith in God is an obedient faith. Elsewhere, the Apostle John wrote, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The irrationality of the position that a person is saved from his sins by faith alone, apart from any act of obedience, is apparent in the fact that God commands humanity to believe in him. And thus to believe in God is to be obedient to a command of God to believe. As John wrote in 1 John 3, 23, And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So, to not believe is to disobey God, and to believe is to obey. In one respect, in the preliminary sense of the word, to believe in Jesus means to mentally acknowledge that he is the Son of God and man's one and only Savior. A John 3.16 type of saving faith certainly includes this sense of believing but it also comprises so much more. It includes trusting in the lifted up Savior, being born again of water and of the Spirit, and obeying the Son. Becoming a believer in the full sense of the word is to completely put one's trust in the Savior, not merely to acknowledge Him, but to follow Him wherever He leads, even to the point of death.